So we pray that you will help us again this morning. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight, today's uh, sermon I've entitled as the Great Commission, not the Great Omission. That is the Great Commission, not the Great Omission. And from the title, you can probably guess what I want to talk about today. So, yeah. So, if you've got your Bibles, can you turn to Matthew 28 and verse 18? That's Matthew 28, verse 18. says, Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make up disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus here, if, you, if you've been a Christian for some time, you will know this scripture, I'm sure, very well. And Jesus here, first of all, says that there's three steps. And that is the going, that is the baptizing, and then there is the teaching. These are the three steps that Jesus was talking about here, that we had to go and make disciples. And some of us might be better at the going, some of us might be better at the teaching, but all these things are what Jesus told us to do, that we had to go and make disciples. And just on a side issue, it says to baptize them in the name. Now note that it says name and not names. And this is another indication that God is one in three persons. This is an indication here that God is a trinity. It doesn't say names, it says name. So just to get back to what we're talking about today, you know, sometimes we might feel that we're alone. We might feel that we're lonely or that we're all alone. What Jesus said here also, he promised that he would always be with us until the very end of the age. I mean, sometimes when you're evangelizing and you're talking to people, you will find that very often you're going to be, you're, you're the only person who's there witnessing to people. You might be the only person on the street. You might be the only person at work who is a Christian. But Jesus said that he would be with us, that he would give us the words to say at that time. And so we are never on our own. We are never really in a minority. If God is with us, then we are always in a majority, even though we might not see that in our own lives. We are never really alone. So if we can turn to Acts 1 and verse 8, that's Acts 1 and verse 8. And this is another scripture that is a very well-known scripture, but I just want to read it because I think it's good to remind ourselves of this. And Jesus, and Jesus said that, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the word here for witnesses is a Greek word, and it can also be translated as martyr. And when we are called to be witnesses for God, when we are called to be witnesses for Jesus, there has to be a dying to self. There has to be a reckoning because it's not easy to be a witness. It's not easy to witness for Jesus. It's not easy to go out on a Saturday morning and tell people about Jesus, even if you're only just handing out a leaflet to somebody. There's still going to be a struggle. There's still going to be a fight in your life. And many years ago, when I was first a Christian, we had a meeting at Cliff College, and there was two guys there called Steve and Stuart. And these, these two guys, one of them was an evangelist and he'd worked with Reinhard Bonnke in Africa. And his testimony was uh, quite interesting actually because he'd actually got saved uh, through a blind monk. And he was in this uh, place and, and, he's, and he was saying that this, this monk was going to get him converted and he was trying to get out of the place. And he realized that God was speaking to him. So God can even use somebody like that. You know, and then I remember after we'd been at Cliff College, Steve and Stuart said that they would give us an example of how to go and evangelize. And they took us out onto the streets. It was actually the streets of Shirebrook that we went out onto. And I always remember Steve saying that every time he went out, he had to 
died to self, he never found it easy to go out and be a witness for Jesus. Even though he'd done it many times for many years and he was an evangelist, he said that every time he went out, it was still a hard thing to do. So as Christians, we should not find it hard. We should not find it surprising if that when we go out on a Saturday morning or if we're witnesses for him at work or wherever we might be in our family, if, some, if it's going to be hard because, you know, we need the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. But Jesus said that if we were baptized with the Holy Spirit, then we would be able to do things that we would not normally be able to do. The Holy Spirit would come upon us and he would give us the power to do those things. When I was first a new Christian, I'd been in church about six months, and I realized that as Christians that we should witness for God, that we, we have been called to be his witnesses. So I decided that I was going to start going out onto the doors and evangelizing and talking to people about Jesus. And that is not something that I would normally have been able to do on my own, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, God can change us and we will find that you will do things that you wouldn't normally be doing in your own natural strength. And this is what we need in our lives. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, we all struggle and we all feel weak sometimes when it comes to this. But if we have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we'll find that we're doing things that we wouldn't normally be able to do. You know, some people like to be at the front. Some people like to be in the spotlight. But there are many of us, myself included, who do not naturally want to be in the spotlight. You know, like King Saul, he was hiding among the baggage. And Moses, when he was called, he said, I cannot go, I cannot speak. And that's how many of us are. Many of us are the same as that. We want to hide away. We want to be at the back of the church. But God has called us to be his witnesses. God has called us to speak for him, whether it's in a church situation or whether it's out there on the streets. We cannot run away from God's spirit because God's spirit is everywhere. Uh, can we turn to Ezekiel 2? and verse 1, that's Ezekiel 2 and verse 1. It says, So when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. Then the Spirit entered me, and when he spoke to me, and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they hear you or whether they refuse, they, because they are a rebellious house, Yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of their words. Through briars and thorns are with you. You will dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. So Ezekiel was sent to the people of Israel, and God said to him that whether they listen or not, he is to still to speak to them. And we, as Christians, when we go out into the streets of Chesterfield, we may feel that people are not listening, that nobody wants to hear what we're saying to them. But as Christians, we're still called to go. And we are not to be afraid of them. We are not to be afraid of the way they look at us, or if they sneer at us, or if they swear at us, or whatever they may say to us. Because that is what God has told us to do. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit of power, and of love and a sound mind. So, and then in verse 4, it says that they are stiff necked and hard hearted people. And that is how we once were. We were once the same, but by God's grace, we came to believe. There was a time when I didn't even really believe in God in my life. So, if God can change our lives, why can God not change those people out there? You know, it's it's not impossible for what, to God to save people in this town. In fact, we have seen people, the people 
who are sitting here in this church today that have been saved through us going out and, and evangelizing. Um, if we can turn to Ezekiel 33 and verse 1. That's Ezekiel 33 and verse 1. It says, And again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory, and make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon his own head. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person among them, he is taken away his iniquity. <coughs> but his blood I will require of the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth, and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require on your head. So God is saying to Ezekiel here that he has appointed him as a watchman, and God has appointed us as watchmen and watchwomen to this town. We are responsible for the people in Chesterfield, we are responsible to blow the trumpet, as it were, to go out and to warn people of the coming judgment and to warn people that they are on the road to hell. It is our responsibility to try and tell people, however little it may seem in our own eyes, even if it's just giving a track to somebody, even if it's just trying to have a conversation with somebody out on the streets. We are responsible to tell people, and if we do not tell people, then we ourselves will be held responsible for not warning people. We are living in the last days. If you've been watching the news recently, you will know what's happening in Syria, and we do not know where that might end up. You know, the time is very short, and God is soon going to judge this world, and we are going to be held responsible for telling people. This is what church is about. This is why we are here as a church. This is the heart of the church, is to, to try and reach out to those who are around us. So we are responsible, you know, for, to pray for the people of Chesterfield. We're responsible to try and reach out to the people of Chesterfield. An unbeliever once said that he didn't believe in hell, but he said that if he did believe in hell, that he would spend 24-7 of his life trying to tell people about hell and if we really believe there is such a place as hell then we should be concerned about the people if we stop to imagine just for a minute what it means the bible says that people in hell will be tormented day and night forever and ever now that is to me is beyond imagination to try and even comprehend what that would be like but that is what god is saying in his word and so we are to warn people we have to try and tell people that there is a good news we are trying to tell people about Jesus and whether they listen or do not listen we have to try and tell them otherwise we are held responsible so when you go out onto the streets and we try and tell people about Jesus very often they will reject Jesus I've, I've noticed that probably even 90% of people will not even take a tract from us and people say how can a loving God send people to hell but God doesn't want anyone to be sent to hell God doesn't actually send anyone to hell that's why he sent Jesus to die for our sins so that nobody would have to go to hell but it's people who reject God people reject God every day when we try to reach out to them when we try to tell them about Jesus they reject God and they reject his love they reject his kindness they reject his grace and they reject his mercy and one day because God is a loving God he will give them what he wants and he will withdraw from them. He will withdraw his love and his kindness and his grace and his mercy. And all that will be left is what we call hell. So God does not reject anyone. It's people that are rejecting God. It's people that are rejecting the Holy Spirit. 
and we have to be careful in our own lives that we ourselves are not rejecting the Holy Spirit, <coughs> what God is trying to say to us. Um, so, again, how can we be his witnesses? It's not easy to be a witness for Jesus. The hardest thing in life, actually, <coughs> is to be a true Christian. There are few that are really true Christians. There are many that claim to be Christians, but Jesus has called us to be disciples. And to, li to live a true Christian life is the hardest thing in the world to do. And there was a guy called Richard Wernbrand, who was a, a Romanian Christian, and he was a Christian during the time of the uh, communists in Romania. And he wrote a book which was called Tortured for Christ. And this book is not an easy read. It's not, it's not for the squeamish. My wife read it, and afterwards she had some sleepless nights. So this guy, he was a preacher in Romania during the time of communism. And because he preached, and he preached the gospel, he was locked up for eight and a half years for preaching about Christ. And then he was released, and immediately he went back to preaching about Jesus and preaching about Christ. So after three years, they sentenced him again to 25 years this time because he told people about Jesus. And three of those years he spent in solitary confinement. And each night he would deliver a sermon to himself. And because he had such an extraordinary memory, he was able to memorize 350 sermons. And these sermons that he, when he was later released, he preached these sermons. And the secret police even came and visited his wife and told his wife that they had seen him, uh, is that been to his own funeral. They pretended to be prisoners that had been released from the prison and, and they told his wife that he'd actually died in prison, which was not true. And then his wife was arrested and she was sentenced <coughs> to three years in prison. And their son was expelled from college because of his father. But then in 1964, there was a ransom paid for him to be released $10,000 and he was uh, able to go to Norway and then he went to Britain and eventually he went to live in the USA and then in <coughs> 1990 Richard Wernbrand and his wife were able to return to Romania after the fall of communism and preach again and after 25 years he was able to go back to his own country and to preach again because you know the devil <coughs> cannot win atheists cannot win the devil is defeated and though it may seem that they win for a time in the end they cannot win because God has given us the victory and this man was able to make a stand for Christ and if he can make a stand for Christ in a, in a country that's dominated by communism then we should be able to make a stand for Christ in this town you know we have faced some opposition from the council in this town and anyone that preaches the gospel will face opposition <coughs> and if everybody likes us and if we never get any problems or we never get anything said against us then we're probably doing something wrong because Jesus said that the world would hate us mm. there are many that compromise who claim to be Christians in the church and they never have any problems from the authorities <laughs> or anyone and because they compromise with what Jesus has told them to say so we as Christians we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against the council. We wrestle against the principalities and powers that are behind the council, that are trying to stop us from preaching in this town. You know, we're supposed to live in a so-called Christian country where we have uh, fr freedom of religion, but because of the way this country is going, more and more Christians are being marginalized and we're being attacked in various and different ways so we should not be surprised at this. If you read the Bible and if you read about church history, you will find that all the time this happens again and again, that anyone that makes a true stand for Jesus and for Christ will always face this opposition. So there are many different ways for us to be a witness. There's many different ways for us to tell people about Jesus. Even uh, Facebook can be used for evangelism. I saw a video some time ago on, on Facebook and this guy was a former atheist 
and he'd been somewhere and he was just going back home and this girl gave him a tract and he meant to just go home and throw this leaflet in the bin but for some reason he got home and he read this leaflet and he'd been brought up as a Christian but he turned his back on God and when he read this leaflet he suddenly was convicted by the Holy Spirit and he fell down on his knees and he gave his life to God again, he repented. And I don't know whether he went back to tell this girl what had happened or not. I hope he did and I hope that he was able to find her and encourage her for what she'd done. But you know, God can still use just a leaflet or a tract, even though we might think it's just a small thing that we're doing. So we should never, you know, look down on what we're doing or say that we're not very good at witnessing or we can't do this or we can't do that because God can still use the smallest thing to save a person. Mm -hmm. And if we've given out 10,000 tracts or 20,000 tracts in Chesterfield and if only one person gets saved, then it's still been worthwhile because you cannot put a price on anyone's salvation. So we are to sow seeds. We need to sow seeds in Chesterfield in any way that we can. You know, people might say, well, we're wasting our time sowing out to evangelism. But, you know, people say, <coughs> why is the leadership made evangelism mandatory in the church? Well, actually, the, the leadership hasn't made it mandatory because Jesus made it mandatory 2,000 years ago when he said, go and make disciple. So, it was Jesus that said that. And he didn't say, go and make disciples when you feel like, or go and make disciples when you have time to do it. <coughs> It's the heart of the church, it's the heart of this church, and there are many churches, even in Chesterfield, where people can be pew fillers or just go to church once on a Sunday. But I think once you've been in this church for you know, a brief period of time, you'll realise that this is not that kind of church, that Grace Chapel is a different kind of church. It's a church that's trying to do the right thing in this town, and for a small church, I believe, it's making a big impact upon this town. <laughs> and anyone that's been in the army will know that the command that you follow the last orders that your commanding officer gave you. And the last command that Jesus gave us was to go into all the world and make disciples. So until Jesus has given us a different command, that is what we are to do. Yeah. So people say, that the internet is like a web, they call it the World Wide Web, and certainly it can be. There are many people that can get trapped in the internet with addictions, but also the internet can be used for evangelism. There are many people who are preaching many different things on YouTube, on Facebook, and if Christians do not stand up and tell people what is the right, do not tell people the truth, then more and more people are going to get deceived through the internet, through Facebook. So through Facebook, you're actually able to preach to your friends, you're able to share the gospel with all your friends on Facebook. And, it, and you can even talk to somebody who's a Muslim in Saudi Arabia, you can actually tell them tr the truth about Jesus and tell them that Jesus actually did die for them because Muslims do not believe that. They do not believe that Jesus was crucified on the cross. So we can actually be a missionary just sitting in your own home. You can talk to people all around the world and tell them the truth about Jesus. There is no barrier now to the internet. There are people in Saudi Arabia where they're not even allowed to own a Bible, but you can talk to them about Jesus because these barriers are being taken away. So there are many different ways for us to preach the gospel, many different ways for us to spread the gospel. And some people might say, well, I just like to talk to my friends and I just like to witness in that way. And we should do that. We should witness to our friends. But why not also do it in a corporate way? Why not also do it as a body, as the, as the church? You know, people wouldn't say, well, I just like to pray on my own. But then when we have a, a corporate prayer meeting, I don't want to go to that. As a church, you know, we should do it in a, in a methodical way. We should go out sometimes as we do on Saturdays and try and tell people about Jesus because Jesus 
while he did do personal evangelism, like when he talked to the woman at the well, most of the time he was actually talking to the crowd. So I think it's very biblical that we go out as a church and to the people of Chesterfield. You know, we're called to be disciples. We're not called to be churchified. We're not called to just come to church once a week. Some people think that they're doing well if they come to church every Sunday. But, you know, going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. And going, to, going to church does not make you a Christian. There's much more to it than that. You know, people can shout amen in church when something's preached. But then... If they do not live it, they're not really saying amen. It's better to not say amen, but actually do what's being preached in church and live an example and say amen in that way. So, you know, many of us work full time. Many of us have very busy lives. But we have a rotor and it's only one hour a month that we have to go out and tell people about Jesus. So that's only really 15 minutes a week and I think I don't think it's a lot to ask that we should be able to find 15 minutes a week to tell people about Jesus because this is the heart of the church this is why we exist as Christians when we first became Christians we could have been raptured and taken up to heaven straight away but we were left here to tell others about Jesus you know are we here to worship well we can worship better in heaven than we could ever worship down here so the church exists for those who are not yet in it and that if people will not go to church then we the church need to go to the people um, can we turn to Luke 14 and verse 16 that's Luke 14 and verse 16 Jesus said then he said to him a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited come for all things are now ready but they all with one accord began to make excuses the first one said I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it I asked you to have I asked you to have me excused and another said I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them I ask you to me to be excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that they, that they be in my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste in my supper. So Jesus is saying here that the kingdom of God is like a banquet. The kingdom of God is like a great party. That is what we are inviting people to when we go out to them. And then he says, in verse 23 I think it is it says to go out and compel them to come in and that is what we are to do we are to go out and try and compel people to come in to this great party that God has called us to to this great banquet and to compel them means to urge them we are to try and urge them to flee the coming wrath to come the coming judgment upon them and somehow we have to try and convince them and we can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it takes a, a step of faith. Faith is like a muscle. And each time you excise a muscle, it grows. And that's how our faith needs to grow. We need to step out in faith. You know, for some of us, it might just be going out and witnessing to people. That might be a step of faith. I remember the first time that I went out with on the streets it wasn't easy to go out but it's become easier to go out the more times I've gone out and when I was first in Grace Chapel I think me and Lorna had been here for maybe six months or a year and we were walking through town one day and we saw Sean and Tandy was out, outside uh, Marks and Spencer I think it was 
uh, witnessing it and handing out tracks and the Holy Spirit said to me you should be doing that as well and you know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you because it's usually something that you would not naturally want to do or feel able to do and I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying the same to some of us here today that we also should go out you know very often we know what we should do but we keep ignoring what the Holy Spirit is saying to us it's not easy to follow what the Holy Spirit is saying to us but sometimes very clearly the Holy Spirit says something to us and uh, to conclude can we turn to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16 that's 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16 It says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So Paul is here saying, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So it's very important that we do preach the gospel. In some way, we need to preach the gospel. We need to try and reach out to people. It's not easy to make a stand. It's not easy when you're in a minority at work or wherever you might be, you know, and I think many times we failed at this. And there is a song by Hillsong United which says, A thousand times I have failed, but still your mercy remains. And we might have failed a thousand times to be witnesses for Christ, but his mercy still remains. And we need to resolve to do better, and that by God's grace we will do better in the future. Amen. Amen.